that the dollar is likely going to go through a drop in value as the Fed ten, will tend to pause at some point, whether it's in June or later this year. As soon as that happens, the other banks are still raising interest rates. So you're going to see the dollar drop in relation to that. And Bitcoin is a great hedge against that. Uh, the halvening essentially results in a miner receiving half as many Bitcoin going forward for their hash rate. And so if the price of Bitcoin isn't substantially above you know, $40,000 come to happening uh, based on the current global hash rate trends, uh, then I think a lot of miners are going to be challenged um, come uh, post-May next year. Three themes we'll be discussing today. Can the price of Bitcoin breach new all-time highs within a year? What will drive Bitcoin adoption both in the short term and long term? And what is the future of Bitcoin and crypto mining in light of increasing mining difficulty? Well, here to discuss these themes with us is a leader in Bitcoin mining. He is Fred Thiel, CEO of Marathon Digital Holdings, the largest Bitcoin miner in the United States with more than 11,000 BTC on their balance sheet. Marathon Digital Holdings is listed on the NASDAQ as ticker M-A-R-A. Fred himself has had over 25 years of experience being the leader of several tech companies, including GameSpy, Local Corporation, and Lantronics. He's worked in the cryptocurrency, digital assets, and semiconductor and other tech spaces. Fred, welcome to my show. It's a pleasure to host you on the David Lynn Report. David, great to be here. Just uh, this week, Standard Chartered Bank, uh, one of their analysts released a report that was on the news today, and Standard Chartered uh, is predicting $100,000 Bitcoin by the end of the year. One of the reasoning or one of the points of the rationale was that and i'll just read this quote against the backdrop of banks collapsing and financial turmoil bitcoin has benefited from its status as a branded safe haven a perceived relative store of value and a means of remittance now these are obviously characteristics of bitcoin that have always been there i'm just wondering why these points have been brought up to the forefront now in light of what's going on in our economy well, I think part of the reason is, you know, with the closure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and kind of the fear of a banking crisis, uh, a number of people have decided, have thought, you know, where am I going to move my funds? Where am I going to hold my funds? And uh, Bitcoin happens to provide a great store of value. And if you look at whether it's on a risk adjusted perspective or not, Bitcoin has outperformed virtually every other asset this year and has been a great performer. So if you believe that Bitcoin will appreciate in price over the course of the year as we get in towards the halving, which would be a kind of historical pattern, and you also believe that you know inflation is going to continue and the US dollar will be continued to be debased uh, and other currencies are going to have issues because of interest rates, uh, then Bitcoin is increasing its correlation to gold, where traditionally Bitcoin has been very correlated to equity markets. The correlation to gold is now increasing as a safe haven asset. The other thing is you have you know central banks of the BRICS countries, so um, you know the countries that essentially have decided that they're going to move uh, their assets into gold as much as possible. So when you have central banks buying large amounts of gold. Um, you know, Brazil, Russia, China, India, um, Iran, South Africa, and others. Um, you know, it tends to draw some liquidity towards Bitcoin. I think we've also seen a lot of international interest uh, from family offices and people who are not dollar denominated in their assets uh, look at Bitcoin now that the dollar is likely going to go through a drop in value as the Fed ten, will tend to pause at some point whether it's in June or later this year, as soon as that happens, the other banks are still raising interest rates. So you're going to see the dollar drop in relation to that. And Bitcoin is a great hedge against that. Uh, this ties into your company strategy and philosophy. Marathon Digital Holdings mines Bitcoin and then holds, I believe, the majority of the Bitcoin you mine, correct? Uh, it says on your financial statements that holding Bitcoin is a strategy to act as a store of value. And you've You've just explained why. Uh, it also says that we believe that Bitcoin offers additional opportunity for appreciation in value with increasing adoption due to its limited supply. Tell us about the increasing adoption aspect. Why do you think Bitcoin will see increasing adoption in the coming years? And what is this adoption going to be in? 
So it's going to come in a number of ways. Uh, one, you're already seeing uh, ordinals, which is kind of a Bitcoin-esque version of NFTs, if you would. You're essentially storing graphic images and content in the four megabytes of, of block space that's in each block. Um, there have been over a million ordinals that have been um, essentially registered on the Bitcoin blockchain. What that does is, A, it sucks up more block space, which means financial transactions have to get in queue to get into the block space. And it's also increasing transaction fees for miners like ourselves, where previously we were seeing typical transaction fees in the kind of um, five one hundredths of a Bitcoin per block. We're now starting to see somewhere upwards of three tenths of a Bitcoin, four tenths of a Bitcoin uh, as transaction fees. So ordinals is one use case. Another uh, set of use cases are the side chains where they register on the Bitcoin blockchain for security purposes. So imagine today, if you wanted to create a side chain that was going to track ownership in real estate titles, or it was going to track uh, rare stamps, whatever it might be, you would typically have to choose, do I want to do proof of work? Do I want to do proof of stake? Well, now with side chains on the Bitcoin blockchain, you can essentially operate a copy of the Bitcoin blockchain where you're storing whatever it is you're tracking in your blockchain, but then you're essentially storing a hash in on the real Bitcoin blockchain, the primary chain. And that means that anybody at any time can go back and compare the hash of your block to your side chain to the one that you stored on the Bitcoin blockchain to make sure that there hasn't been any changes to your blockchain. And so it allows you to do have all the same security that the Bitcoin blockchain offers without having to do proof of work or proof of stake. So now this is a much more interesting environment than um, working in other blockchains or creating your own level one blockchain. So we think that's going to drive accelerated adoption. But if you just look at the number of wallet addresses with uh, under 10 Bitcoin in them, which are essentially you know a wallet address that's holding less than $300,000 worth of Bitcoin in it. Uh, those are increasing at a very steady pace. And even wallets with less than a Bitcoin are increasing at a steady pace. And if you look at kind of a line graph of this data going back a few years, its adoption has continued at a pretty steady pace and we expect it to continue. Lightning is getting easier to use. You'll see new applications for identity, healthcare data, other things on the Bitcoin blockchain. So we, we feel very optimistic that Bitcoin and the technology around Bitcoin is a lot more like the internet. You know, if you think about the internet, you have TCP IP. It's a very basic protocol and it hasn't changed in decades. You know, the vast majority of traffic on the internet still operates under TCP version four, which has existed for decades. Version six has come out um, again, over a decade and a half ago, and still there isn't a huge amount of adoption of TCP IP v6. So Bitcoin is a very simple network. The Ethereum network is much more complicated. It's a programmable network. You do more programming in the actual base layer. What that means is that you build applications at layers two and three on the Bitcoin blockchain, just like the internet. SMTP, uh, SNMP, all of these protocols run on top of the internet um, and network protocols. So we believe that if Bitcoin follows the Internet's uh, adoption rate, you're going to see pretty massive adoption over the next decade for all things that run on top of or adjacent to Bitcoin. What kind of adoption are we talking about? I've heard the uh, prognosis that perhaps 10 to 15 percent of the global population could use cryptos, not, not just Bitcoin exclusively, but cryptos. Is that something that could happen over the next 10 years is, my, is, is the projection? Yeah, so if you think about that number, roughly global population nearing 9 billion people today, uh, you're saying roughly somewhere between you know, 800 million one billion. and a uh, billion people. Um, you know, I think it's what you're going to see is two different models for adoption or, or versions, if you would. On the one hand, you're going to see in developing countries, financial transactions, settlement, the kind of higher order level things. Uh, then in developing countries, that's where you're going to see a lot of retail use for it. You know, look at countries like Venezuela, look at Argentina. Argentina just raised their interest rates to 81% today. Um, you know, in an environment like that, Turkey, for example, where the currency has been debased, you know, a significant amount this year. Those are places where consumer adoption of Bitcoin and stable coins, crypto in general, 
is accelerating very rapidly because you need to be able to hold your funds in something that's not being debased and be able to move it quickly. And so people don't want to hold funds in banks in those countries. And when you layer on top of that, the unbanked people, you know, 70% of the people who live in Indonesia don't have bank accounts, yet they have to transact and they have phones. So for those types of people, crypto is a great alternative. They can't have bank accounts, but they can have a crypto account. And so I think you're going to see large volume of adoption in developing countries at the consumer level, and you're going to see it at the institutional level in developing countries. Bitcoin dominance, which is the ratio of Bitcoin's market cap versus other altcoins, has reached its nine-month high earlier this week. It's actually currently at about 45 uh, to 46 percent. Um, multi-month high. Is this an indication of sentiment in the crypto market from a trading and investment perspective, or is this an indication of adoption of Bitcoin for its utility? So I think part of it is a psychological factor, which is flight to safety. Uh, you know, when there are crises in the world, historically people have moved investments into U.S. dominated assets because there's a belief that those markets will be somewhat protected or isolated from risk. So Bitcoin being the predominant crypto asset, um, that's a safe place to put your assets. Why? Well, you need some. You need an asset where there's a lot of liquidity available, so you can get in and out of it without necessarily creating slippage and moving the price. Um, and outside of ether, uh, there isn't really any other crypto that offers uh, that uh, other than a stable coin like USDC or USDT. I think a lot of people are concerned about USDT because they live outside of you know Tether lives outside of the regulatory norm. Whereas USDC lives in the regulatory norm, but the challenge with the USDC was, as we saw in the banking uh, crisis that we had, you know, they had three billion dollars of reserves that were uh, essentially a signature, uh, which they got out, but it caused a DPEG. And so I think some people are a little scared about the stable coins. And the benefit with Bitcoin is it's fully decentralized. It doesn't depend on banks other than as an on ramp or off ramp to exchanges or. Uh, you know, marketplaces to buy Bitcoin. So I think Bitcoin generally tends to attract more interest uh, when there are times of fear and it's kind of people are wary of risk in crypto. And, you know, where do I put my crypto denominated assets? Um, but at the same time, you know, we're certainly seeing uh, interest from, uh, you know, large family offices, institutional investors who, because of the limited liquidity on exchanges in Bitcoin are now looking for other ways of acquiring Bitcoin. So they're reaching out to miners, they're reaching out to people who produce Bitcoin and hold large amounts of Bitcoin. And that tells me there's renewed institutional interest. A couple of other anecdotal things I think that are important. You know, in a world where the regulators are kind of going after a lot of the players in the marketplace, Coinbase, Gemini, et cetera, um, you now see NASDAQ getting ready to offer custody of crypto products, Fidelity offering custody of crypto products. You know, NASDAQ may even offer trading of Bitcoin and Ether uh, in the near future. You know, that type of high level institutional infrastructure coming in place only tells me that institutional adoption is going to come. You know, NASDAQ wouldn't spend either the political or the financial capital uh, with regulators to try and get custody and trading approved. Um, same thing with Fidelity. They have too much at risk on their traditional um, securities businesses to want to risk that. So I think the fact that both of those institutions are moving forward, BNY Mellon, one of the largest custodians in the world for, for cash assets as well, uh, indicates to me that the institutional demand is coming. And uh, when that adoption happens, it doesn't need a lot to drive Bitcoin price. You know, If 1% of the money that's allocated to 401ks were to go to uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, you're talking about Bitcoin's price having to go well beyond $100,000. Closing off on the market uh, outlook, I know giving short-term projections is not uh, uh, in your core uh, job uh, description, but uh, going back to the $100,000 call that Standard Charter Bank made by the end of the year, basically they're calling for new all-time highs by the end of the year before the halvening cycle, which will happen next year. Is that realistic? Um you know, our own projections and my personal projections are significantly lower than that. You know, um, I think if you were to talk to most analysts out there, they'd say they expect Bitcoin to be somewhere in the, you know, 30 to 50,000 range at the time of the happening uh, in May of next year. 
Um, and we tend to be in that camp, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50 is a reasonable number. Um, you know, from a miner's perspective, as miners are concerned, um, this is, you know, less of an impact to Bitcoin holders. But, you know, miners receive their um, rewards from the blockchain for mining a block uh, on a daily basis. And uh, the halvening essentially results in a miner receiving half as many Bitcoin going forward for their hash rate. And so if the price of Bitcoin isn't substantially above, you know, $40,000 come the happening uh, based on the current global hash rate trends, uh, then I think a lot of miners are going to be challenged um, come uh, post May next year because uh, their cost to produce a Bitcoin essentially doubles when you have the, re the reward rate. And uh, global hash rate continues to accelerate. We're now at somewhere around 350x a hash. Uh, and, uh, you know, that number is going to likely go to 400 or north of 400 by the end of this year into the halving. So, you know, the cost to produce a Bitcoin gets more expensive as we get closer to the halving. And if you go back to the nuclear kind of winter we just went through, uh, or the crypto winter we went through, um, you know, there were a lot of miners when Bitcoin was at 15,000 that were just not profitable. And so fast forward to the halving plus the growth of the global hash rate, now you end up in a place where, you know, if Bitcoin isn't north of 40, the same conditions will apply. Let, let's talk about mining now. So you $40,000 is a break-even price. Is that for everybody, including your uh, including your company, Marathon Digital? No, I mean, that that's a projected kind of break-even price for the industry, if you would, come the having. So we're talking about in May of next year. So you've got two things playing against you. One is, instead of, you know, 6.25 Bitcoin per block being awarded, It'll be you know three point one two five, so that you're having your amount of rewards essentially. So, but your cost to mine hasn't gone down by half; it's the same. And then, if you look at the difficulty rate increases because of the global hash rate growing, then uh, if we go from you know three hundred and fifty ish today to somewhere around four hundred or four fifty by the having, then you're talking about an additional thirty three percent increase in your cost to mine a Bitcoin. Because if you exert 33% more effort to mine as many Bitcoin as you did before, take that plus the halving. And uh, you know somebody whose break-even cost today is somewhere around 12,000, their break-even cost now goes well north of 20 into the $30,000 range. And so I think the industry on average, um, 40,000 will be a good number. Um, but you know, different miners have different break-even points, obviously, and that's driven by the efficiency of their operations. Are, are you able to comment on yours currently? Um, you know, we don't give a, a break-even number. Uh, we don't publish it, but you know, suffice it to say that um, our Bitcoin mining energy efficiency, so if you look at our fleet of miners being predominantly state-of-the-art uh, S19 XPs from a hash rate perspective, come mid this year, our energy efficiency across our whole 23 exahash will likely be about 24 to 25 joules per terahash. Think of that as watts per terahash, where the industry average will be in the 40s. So our energy efficiency is going to be substantially better. And so then the next question comes in is, well, what's our cost of energy compared to others? And um, you know, that's where you may see some variation. But I think going into the halving, we are extremely well positioned because of the energy efficiency of our net, of our network. I'm curious as to I'm curious as to how Marathon Digital Holdings has grown. I mean, it is the largest Bitcoin miner in the U.S., and so um, what you do, I, I guess, is is I I want I don't want to say good proxy, but it is a good indication of where the industry overall is headed. Uh, Marathon Digital increased production of Bitcoin by roughly 90% year on year between 2022 to 2023. Uh, in 2022, uh, on the year, the company produced 360 Bitcoin. I'm just reading the financials over the course of last year, or, or last year going up, leading up into uh, February 2023, it was 683. So that's about an average of 24 Bitcoins a day versus 13 last year. So a 90% increase. What investments have mm -hmm. you made to secure this kind of growth? So at the end of 2021, we placed what was, I think at the time, one of the largest orders for uh, you know, S19 XPs with Bitmain, the primary vendor of uh, mining rigs. And those machines started getting delivered in the back half of last year. Um, 
and we started deploying them. So if you think about the beginning of last year, we had around three X a half, uh, more or less, of capacity running. Um, that was running primarily in a facility we had in Montana. That facility was shut down completely middle of the last year, went to zero. There was, I think, a month, I think the month of July, we produced uh, single digit numbers of Bitcoin uh, because of that shutdown. And then we turned on our uh, first Texas facility. So we ended last year at about 7x a hash. So we doubled over the course of last year from the beginning to the end of the year. And this year, we will more than triple that from 7 to over 23x a hash. Um, so how did we do it? Uh, I think it was, uh, I would love to say it was all just smart planning. Uh, but obviously, a lot of opportunity falls into that. And we had the opportunity to raise capital in 2020 and 2021 when uh, the markets were very open and amenable. Uh, to Bitcoin miners raising capital. Um, we did a convertible bond offering at the end of 2021, raised $750 million approximately um, with a 1% coupon interest rate, if you would, uh, attached to it um, at about the peak of the market. And uh, so that capital allowed us to then place these large orders. When we place orders for Bitcoin mining rigs, we typically place them with price protection involved, which basically means if the price of Bitcoin and the price of the machines drops, the vendor has to credit us back that. And so when you place an order for, I think it was almost at the time, uh, the cash value of that order was around $800 million. Um, you know, As you get towards receiving those machines, the price of Bitcoin had dropped so much in 2022 that what we ended up paying was significantly less. And what that means is that we had essentially paid for a lot of growth such that as we deployed that hash rate in the back half of last year and now all through this spring where we're growing pretty rapidly, um, you know, all that hash rate growth has been paid for already. So we're sitting in a great position, both financially because we've gotten rid of all our short-term debt and we just have this convertible as the only debt on our balance sheet. And we have a lot of cash in Bitcoin, obviously. Like you said, as hash rates increase, the difficulty to mine also increases. How does a miner, the scale and the size of uh, your company, for example, beat the increasing hash rates and difficulties of mining? Presumably your costs would have to go up per BTC mine. So how do you keep your margins afloat? Well, so what's interesting is um, as the price of Bitcoin moves up, uh, beyond kind of the mid 20s and into the 30s, based on current kind of global hash rate, um, the profitability to mine starts increasing pretty dramatically because your energy cost is relatively fixed. And it's just a question of the difficulty now that drives um, how much uh, your increase in cost is. And year to date, the difficulty rate is about has increased roughly 20 ish percent, 23 percent, I think, most probably year to date. Uh, so from Jan 1 to today. And so, you know, all things being equal, or, you know, miners' costs across the board have gone up by 23% from the start of the year. Um, if you're able to then uh, operate your miners in a way that uh, you can increase efficiency, so you can underclock or overclock, you can minimize curtailment, you can do things like that, you can potentially increase the productivity of your miners and you get to an efficiency level where you're really producing as much Bitcoin as a particular site is capable of doing. And so once you get to those levels, um, then it really comes down just to controlling your, your energy costs. But as Bitcoin price goes north of you know 30,000 in today's world, your energy cost plays less of a role because the margin in Bitcoin is pretty substantial at that point. But if the price of Bitcoin drops you know below 20 again, then I think a lot of miners would have fairly, um, you know, uh, tough margins. Uh, you know, the margin condition. Would you rather? Would you rather uh, upgrade existing infrastructure and equipment to improve efficiency, or would you rather just invest in a new farm uh, and expand the number of machines you have? So it's a great question. Uh, you know, our fleet is relatively young. It consists exclusively of S nineteen J Pros, which are the Media prior generation and S19 XPs, uh, which are the latest generation. And from a hash rate mix, uh, you know, come mid year, it'll be about 66% XPs and 33% S19J Pros. Um, it doesn't really make sense for us to go back to those J Pros and replace them for XPs today, just because of the difference in the cost of the miners. 
is about kind of double. Um, it's much better for us just to keep adding new capacity. And then as those J pros come to a point where they will eventually reach the point where they're not profitable to mine in the site where they are, then we'll look at whatever the current state of the art is then and upgrade those machines at that point. But there's still a lot we can do with overclocking and underclocking that can increase the profitable lifespan of those machines. Uh, you worked in tech for a number of decades. Uh, I just want to get your take on how AI is evolving and how that could influence or potentially impact a miner such as yourself. Is that going to increase efficiency at all, or does it have no impact whatsoever? Oh, it definitely has an impact. So um, the and I, I, I've worked in a specialized area of tech for many years called IoT or Internet of Things, where you know, you are controlling things. And a mining operation is a thing you're controlling. It's a system, right? Like a factory. And so you can use AI for huge benefits there. So for example, just look at energy costs, right? Uh, if you are mining uh, and you're buying energy off the grid, and especially in Texas, where that pricing varies on a continual basis, you are constantly making trade-off decisions about whether you should curtail your miners because energy pricing is spiking, but if that spike is for a very short period of time, then the cycle time of shutting down your miners and then bringing them back up may mean you'll be out of the mining. You won't be mining for uh, a, an extended period of time compared to the time when energy was high priced. So if you can leverage tools that are AI based to learn how the markets act and respond to energy signals, then what you can do is predict okay, this energy spike that we're current, this cost spike we're seeing will be a 10-minute spike, an hour spike, or a four-hour spike. That will drive a different decisioning relative to curtailment. And uh, this is something that you know the folks at ERCOT are very interested in because you know if they're trying to maintain balance in the grid and if miners are all of a sudden you know, ramping up and ramping down based on predictive analytics about energy pricing, that in and of itself will impact energy pricing. And as an example, our facility uh, in West Texas, the King Mountain site, sits behind the meter to big wind farm. Well, that wind farm produces at max capacity over 200 megawatts of energy. And if uh, because of transmission grid congestion, which means basically there isn't enough plumbing to get all that energy to the consumers, um, if that site goes on or goes off the grid at any time, uh, it has a huge impact potentially on localized energy pricing, meaning we could, if we were not mining and selling that energy, it lowers the overall cost of energy in the grid because there's now so much energy available. And if we take it off, then the pricing could go up. So um, miners are going to use AI tools as a way to really drive their energy and curtailment decisions. Uh, we'll also use AI tools to determine if and when we sell Bitcoin based on predictive options. And we'll also use it to fine tune things like underclocking and overclocking. So when do you underclock? Well, when energy prices are higher or price of Bitcoin is low, you can run your miners at a lower energy level, which makes them more energy efficient, which allows you to produce Bitcoin at a lower cost. It's just you'll produce fewer of them because you're essentially running in eco mode. If you are overclocking, it's the opposite. You're running them at excess energy, which means your efficiency drops but it's because all of a sudden maybe global hash rate drops, the profitability increases, it makes sense to overclock your miners. So AI will play a huge role in those decisions as well. All right. Well, uh, that leads to our next part of the conversation, which is legislation, regulation, and the environmental impacts on Bitcoin mining. And you're in the perfect position to comment on all three, being a leader in the space. Now, as you're aware, uh, last November, New York instated a two-year moratorium on new fossil fuel-based cryptocurrency mining operations. The state is trying to work out its economic priorities as well as its environmental priorities. One of the concerns behind this moratorium on mining is is the fact that environmentalists believe that bitcoin is very environmentally or bitcoin mining rather is very environmentally unsound this is the core thesis behind this ban can you comment on this sure um so in new york state specifically um to set some context so in new york you have the population is primarily in the southern part of the state most of the energy generation uh, especially the renewables are in the northern end of the state. So Niagara, you have a lot of hydro up there. 
Um, you have natural gas uh, based energy coming out of the west of the state and then wind energy off the coast on the east side. You have lots of transmission lines for energy uh, from north to south because that's a historical corridor for energy. Um, but you don't have a lot of good transmission line capability east-west in New York. And so what the regulators in New York are trying to do is essentially, if somebody turns back on, and the moratorium is essentially not of fossil fuel mining, but it's specifically behind the meter at a fossil fuel site that has been shut off that you're bringing back online. So reinvigorating already uh, decommissioned uh, natural gas or coal based. Um, I don't think anybody would do a coal site today, but you know they may bring back a natural gas peaker plant. Um, if you were to bring that back online, uh, that's what the moratorium prohibits. You could still add miners to the grid. You can still go sit behind the meter at a renewable site and take hydro or wind uh, or solar. It's simply they don't want fossil fuel being revitalized. Uh, in the state. And so they could have done that through all sorts of other means as well, but it's definitely targeting a specific industry and a specific source of energy for that. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's impacting a lot of people. It's really more people who wanted to go and uh, try and turn back on. New York state has a lot of gas plants that have been shut off that were peaker plants um, that are sitting idle where, you know, in theory, a Bitcoin miner could go buy a gas fired power plant and turn it back on. How would you respond to the general criticism that Bitcoin mining, crypto mining, generally speaking, is bad for the environment? This is just, you know, an opinion out there, not necessarily my own. But for the White House, for example, published a report uh, not too long ago. And in their report, they found that crypto mining globally accounts for about 140 million metric tons of CO2 produced per year, which is roughly 0.3 percent of all greenhouse emissions globally. And there's also the argument that let's say you have a certain number of miners, a thousand miners all competing for the reward, 99% of them are wasted because a few, very few of them actually get that reward. So it's just a tremendous waste of energy. How do you respond? So uh, the ATM network in the US um, realized cash is disappearing. People are using tap to pay and credit cards, debit cards mostly. The ATM networks in the US use over four times more energy than the Bitcoin network uses globally, right? Video games, game consoles, Xboxes, et cetera, use equivalent amount of energy to what Bitcoin uses. Holiday lights in the US at Christmas use more energy than the global Bitcoin network does. The global Bitcoin network uses a fraction of 1% of the energy produced in the world. Now let's talk about stranded energy, right? Bitcoin miners' business depends on being able to buy very inexpensive energy, right? Buying energy directly off the grid isn't an option for most miners. They need to buy stranded energy. What is stranded energy? It's energy that can't be sold to the market. Why can't energy be sold to the market? Well, you've got to realize that the grid is not a battery. The grid is plumbing. And if you put more energy into the grid than is being taken off the grid by people, the grid tends to blow up, transformers blow up. And so what the grid operators are constantly doing is regulating the energy generators capacity in real time so that they're maintaining balance between demand and supply. Now, the type of energy generation that exists in the market today, some energy types can be regulated up and down. Others can't. So, for example, you have nuclear energy at the bottom, which is the type of energy that runs 24-7, 365. It's very difficult for a nuclear power plant to increase production or decrease it on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. They can do it over days. You can't respond, though, to a peak demand spike. Coal, similar thing. It takes days to ramp up and down a coal-fired plant. Then you have natural gas, which is the first type of energy generation, which does have the ability to be turned on and turned off and which is primarily used when peak demand happens. Then only do you get to solar and wind energy. Why are they the last energy that's ever used? Well, it's because they're intermittent. The sun only shines from really 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. effectively for energy generation perspectives. And wind really blows depending on where you are, what time of year it is, in the afternoons and evenings. So when is energy used in the U.S. and the world globally? Well, there's a concept called the duck curve. So think of it as the belly of a duck and its tail and, and its bill. 
where the tail is the morning. People get up around 9 a.m. There's a small peak in energy demand because people are cooking breakfast. They're doing laundry. They have the heat on in the house or air conditioning on. Then energy drops, middle of the day, very low demand for energy. And then it increases in the afternoon and peak demand is 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. So what does that mean? When does solar energy be is produced primarily? It's 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. When is the least amount of demand for energy in this country between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m.? So a lot of solar energy can't be sold because there's no demand for it, right? The grid can't shut down nuclear. They can't shut down coal. They can tell the, the natural gas guys not to produce. But at the end of the day, the solar guys are shut down more frequently than not, as are the wind guys. Why? Well, they don't have energy storage, for one thing. So they can't store that energy and sell it when there is demand. And the other issue is that because they only have a few hours in the day when they can sell energy, they have to take their costs of operating their sites, bake it into their cost. And so that energy becomes quite expensive. So along comes Bitcoin mining. And Bitcoin miners can sit at a solar site. And from nine to three, if they're not able to sell any energy to the grid, the Bitcoin miner can use all that energy. That is not energy that is otherwise going to consumers. It's not energy that's causing any pollution or causing any carbon output. And you have to realize Bitcoin miners don't produce carbon. We consume energy, right? You know, a factory produces carbon. Bitcoin miners are computers, it's a data center. So, you know, Bitcoin mining site doesn't necessarily use or generate more carbon than an Amazon data center would. And so it all has to do with the energy consumption. And where's that energy coming from? Well, over 50% of the energy used by Bitcoin miners is renewable today. Tell me an industry that does that. Very few industries have that high amount of renewable energy. The advantage that Bitcoin miners bring to the grid is that they can shut off at an instant and come back on. And so they act as a balancing factor for the grid. That does two things. It lowers the cost of energy to consumers. If Bitcoin miners weren't buying that solar and wind energy that's excess, then those solar and wind companies have to raise their prices to consumers to cover their operating costs. But because they have a buyer of last resort, which are the Bitcoin miners, they can cover their operating costs and can sell that energy to consumers at a lower price. So I think this whole debate around energy is one where people have to educate themselves, A, understand energy markets and how they work. Energy prices vary widely during the time of the day based on demand. Understand how energy is generated and the inefficiencies that exist in a lot of renewable energy generation because of the lack of battery storage. And so you need to have somebody who's able to suck up all that excess energy. And by the way, in Texas, 20% of the time, energy is negatively priced. That means that energy is being, you're being paid to take the energy. So, you know, people really need to educate themselves on the energy markets and the fact that, you know, just because a Bitcoin miner is using solar energy, it doesn't mean that somebody is turning on a coal fired plant to make up the difference. In this country, we produce 14 to 18% more energy than we use. So there's a lot of wasted capacity before you have to turn on more fossil fuel. Additionally, we waste over 25% of the energy that's generated in this country is lost just in transmission lines, which is more than the global amount of Bitcoin mining energy consumption there is. So, you know, I think people really need to educate themselves and understand that Bitcoin mining provides a huge service to the grid and to consumers, really, around energy uh, and grid balancing. And if it wasn't for Bitcoin miners essentially bringing revenues to the renewable guys, there would be less incentive for the renewable guys to build more sites. Because if you build a solar field or you build a wind farm, you still have to convince the transmission grid operator to build transmission lines. And that's $2 million a mile to run wire from the grid to wherever your generation site is. They won't do that unless they have a guarantee that you'll be operating and up and paying for it. And you can't get a solar site or a wind farm site financed unless you can guarantee you have transmission. It's chicken and egg. And Bitcoin miners provide that guaranteed customer. Well, thank you for clarifying that for us, Fred. But would it, I'm just wondering, would it make economic sense for a miner to vertically integrate energy production into mining such that you have your own production energy production plant whatever source that may be solar wind power coal if yeah. you want uh, well yeah I, I wouldn't go to coal i mean right you know we're, we're big believers in renewable energy so sure. an area we are very actively looking at 
is um, methane. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to note that, by the way, the World Economic Forum released a video recently essentially talking about the benefits of data centers operating that consume methane, which is 80 times more damaging to the environment than carbon dioxide is. And the company that they highlighted in that video was Caruso Energy, which is a Bitcoin miner that essentially is burning methane uh, and converting into Bitcoin. So we are big believers in um, using methane gas, capturing it, uh, converting it to energy, and then using that energy to run Bitcoin mines. And there are thousands and thousands of landfills in this country where the methane gas is either just flared or can't be converted to electricity because there are no transmission lines to buy it and it can't be converted into liquefied natural gas because there's no pipeline near them. We believe as Bitcoin miners, there's a great opportunity to go in, generate electricity at those sites by burning the methane, capturing that methane, converting it to carbon dioxide essentially, which is decreasing the damage that methane does, and then taking those renewable energy credits that are generated by doing that and subsidizing our cost to produce a Bitcoin, which essentially may get our energy costs to near zero potentially. Um, depending on pricing of RECs and, and that. So we're big believers in you know, becoming very vertically integrated in that area. What is the largest component of the cost of mining? Is it energy? Yeah, energy costs are by far the biggest component. It's our biggest, single biggest input cost um, to mine Bitcoin. And um, you know, depreciation of miners, uh, you know, non-cap charges like that you know, play a role as well. But um, if you look at... Uh, your cash cost to produce a Bitcoin, the vast majority of it is energy. So what do you think regulation is headed in the U.S.? Uh, do you think there's ever going to come a point where uh, they're going to crack down on mining as hard as, let's say, China did? Well, I think there are different agendas. Um, luckily, uh, we have multiple bodies of government in this country or multiple branches. Um, so there's some checks and balances. Um, you know, You could argue that in China, the uh desire to prohibit bitcoin had more to do with capital flight and currency control than it had to do with energy um because uh right on the heels of banning bitcoin they launched the yuan um and you know they launched essentially a central bank digital currency which provides them with the ability to essentially control financial transactions uh which is in line with kind of the philosophy that the current regime in china is, is following around social scores, things like that. Um, in the US, um, you have kind of two camps. You have one camp who believe that, um, you know, Bitcoin should just convert to proof of stake like uh, Ethereum and, uh, you know, not use energy at all. The problem is that you can't have security uh, in proof of stake that you have in proof of work. You know, Vitalik, Vitaren, who founder, co-founders of uh, Ethereum, uh, co-developers, um, you know, has famously said, you know, well, proof of stake is good enough security. Um, the problem is it's highly centralized. Uh, Ethereum is very centrally controlled um, at multiple levels and uh, staking has increased that. Uh, so proof of work is highly decentralized, which is safe. In the US, you do have some concern about uh, Bitcoin and its ability to allow people to kind of operate outside the traditional financial system. And there are certain members of Congress who would love to be able to control how people manage their finances and have a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, so that the U.S. could do things. Realize that in the U.S. in 1933, um, prior to 1933, Americans could hold gold. Uh, and in 1933, through a, a executive order, Americans were prohibited from owning gold. Why? Well, it's because the government needed consumers to or you know, citizens to invest in savings bonds, essentially treasury bills, you could think of it, because the government needed the money. And instead, they had been putting it in gold. And, um, you know, then you go fast forward, look at Bretton Woods when the dollar was pegged to the dollar, uh, to the gold, and then they changed that peg. And so uh, having citizens holding a lot of capital in Bitcoin is something certain people in Washington view as a threat. Uh, I think there's a contingency of people who, um, you know, view the energy consumption of Bitcoin as bad, but I think 90% of them would have a different opinion if they really understood how the energy markets work. And they're really just reading a lot of rhetoric that's being put out by certain camps who are anti-Bitcoin. Uh, you know, the founder of Ripple uh, famously is, you know, funding Greenpeace, 
to specifically target Bitcoin and proof of work is something bad. And, uh, you know, they famously Greenpeace funded this artist who did this sculpture and the artist uh, quickly retracted his support for the initiative because he realized that Bitcoin actually wasn't as bad for the environment as Greenpeace had made it out to be. So I think you have two different camps. You have some of the Republicans who are uh, being supportive of Bitcoin. You have states like Arkansas who are passing laws to protect the rights of Bitcoin miners. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see kind of a, a battle um, amongst people who uh, understand crypto and the benefits of crypto and people who don't. And I think it would be a shame if the U.S. lost the initiative that, and the advantages that they have had um, that China gave them really when it prohibited Bitcoin mining to consolidate a lot of Bitcoin mining in the U.S. because uh, it'll just move offshore if the U.S. gets an, more antagonistic to it. And um, that will mean the U.S. won't control it at all versus at least if a lot of Bitcoin mining is done in the U.S., the U.S. would have an impact on it. So. What is your long-term plan and vision for Marathon Digital Holdings? Is it primarily going to be uh, sticking with Bitcoin? Are you planning to move into the altcoin space more heavily? Um, are you planning to move into other assets? I, I do understand that the history of the company has evolved from minerals, physical minerals, to digital assets. So I'm curious what the next stage of this evolution would be. Yeah, so the, the first thing Marathon ever did was mine actually vanadium as a mineral. Um, and then it did a lot of other things before it came to Bitcoin mining. But, uh, you know, our vision is really primarily focused around Bitcoin and then uh, ancillary technologies. And we have built our own very vertically integrated tech stack. We operate our own mining pool. We have our own firmware for our miners that we're deploying now. Um, our own controller board technology. We work very closely with immersion vendors to customize the immersion, so the immersion technology that's being used. The first kind of manifestation of this is the site we're building in UAE, which will be the largest data center in the Middle East, 250 megawatts. Uh, that's fully designed uh, using our technology, vertically integrated. And um, as we continue to develop those technologies, we'll eventually maybe start selling some of that technology to other people in the industry. There are other industries that can benefit from some of the immersion technology we're developing, such as operators of cell phone towers and other data centers. So you'll see some diversification along the technology axis of our business. I don't think you'll see us do other altcoins necessarily. Um, we're too big at what we do. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, when Apple's going to go into a new market, the market's got to be big enough. There are no real altcoins that are of size enough where us coming in and mining wouldn't actually just crash the market. You know, you have to think about that. So, um, and Ethereum, there's no mining, it's staking. And I think uh, the economic benefit to being a, a staker, when interest, when you can get four and a half percent of your money in a bank account, why are you going to put your Ether at risk to get four and a half percent essentially? Um, staking fees when at any given time things can happen and there can be a fork and you know you could lose access to your ether. So I think personally that the places where you'll see Marathon will be in these side chains that I talked about earlier. You'll see us offering in infrastructure solutions there. You'll see us offering technology solutions for mining and uh, you know that'll cover us likely for uh, the next number of years. You, I, this question has nothing to do with Bitcoin or anything, but mm -hmm. you were previously CEO of GameSpy. I'm a big gaming yep. fan myself. I don't have time to play video games anymore, but uh, you know, I still follow this space. Where do you see the future mm -hmm. of gaming? Is it is it in hardware still, like on computers? Is it in the metaverse? Is it with VR? What's the dominant medium of gaming in the future in 10, 20 years, you think? Well, I, I think the movie and the book Ready Player One is a great preview of where this is all going. Uh, you know, it's totally immersive. Uh, you already have a lot of haptic technology that lets you, you know, feel, um, you know, you can be, if you're using one of the, if you're in playing one of these games where, you know, there's a first person shooter or some fighting going on, you know, there are vests and gloves and things you can wear that, you know, you can feel when you get shot, you can feel when you get hit. Um, I think the real leap will happen um, relative to games uh, in two areas. One is augmented reality. So if you think about uh, this version of Pokemon uh, that became very popular yeah. uh, a few years ago with cell phones, that's augmented reality. You know, you're mixing the real world with a game. I think with Apple's new glasses that they're launching, while this is a first generation product, I think by the time they get to Gen 2 or 3, it will be 
in typical Apple fashion, so easy to use and adopt that, you know, the um, virtual world and the real world will blend very easily together. And I think that'll create huge opportunities for entertainment and games. Um, and then you have true full immersion, which is, you know, when the brain machine interface gets to a point where you don't need to wear anything haptic, but rather the game can directly stimulate your nervous system, um, which sounds like weird, freaky science fiction, but it isn't. I mean, Elon Musk is doing uh, a brain, an embedded brain uh, product. And by the way, there are other technologies that don't require anything invasive that are getting quite close around the nerve stimulation. Um, I think that's when you'll see this ultimate kind of, uh, you know, gaming experience where you go into some sort of pod or something like that, like going to the movie Avatar, and you are in the game and it's immersive. Um, and that's where also a commercial world and a world of a social world will blend with games. And that's where you get this kind of metaverse as people talk about it. All right, Fred. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. And thank you for spending the time to educate us about regulations and how mining works and the direction of the Bitcoin and crypto industries. Thank you. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, David. You take care. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.